All right, welcome in everybody. Um, my name is Richard Sharp. I am an assistant director in university housing and you are uh, currently signed on to our housing renewal application process webinar. So um, a little bit about what we're gonna do here for the next um, maybe hour is uh, we're gonna go over the process uh, and we'll give folks the opportunity to message us in questions as we go and um, yeah, if you do have any questions, please feel free to send them in. Uh, as you probably heard, we are recording the webinar and we will make this available on our website uh, here by the end of the week. So um, if you do want to refer to anything um, following the presentation, uh, you'll be able to find it on the housing website. So I will let my colleagues introduce themselves and then we will go ahead and get started. I'll jump in. Hey, good to see everybody this evening. My name is Carl Diesso. I serve as the Assistant Vice President for Housing Services. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan McGill. I'm the Associate Director of Housing. Uh, a little bit later in the presentation, I'll be walking you through some of the steps to the housing application process and kind of give you sort of the operational things that you'll need to do uh, if you're going to be applying for housing with us for the upcoming fall. So, All right. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Dan. So, um, what we'll do is we'll have Carl kick us off here and um, he's gonna go over some uh, housing context for us. Richard, real quick before I get going, um, if you wouldn't mind commenting for everybody, if they have, have questions um, as we're working through the webinar, how can they get those to us? I know we'll have a question and answer period towards the end, but just as they're thinking through and listening, I'm sure they'll be taking notes, giving some guidance here. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone has any questions as we're going, please feel free to drop them in our chat and um, we will either do our best to answer them in the moment as you send them in, uh, assuming they are on like the subject that we're speaking of uh, at the moment. Otherwise, we will uh, answer them probably more towards the end um, and just kind of run through uh, anything that gets asked. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So use the chat feature. And then we'll remind folks, if you have personal questions, this is not particularly the forum for that. If it's something that's nuanced, very specific, personal to you, what we'd encourage you to do is reach out to our office. Um, you know, we're there Monday through Friday, uh, generally 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for uh, phone calls. We do staff the phones a little earlier. So if you're, you're up 8.30, uh, 8 o'clock, you can, you can get in touch with us or send your email in. But um, you also have some contact information for us towards the end of the presentation if there's a reason for you to follow up with any of the three of us directly. Uh, but just want to make sure you're aware how that works tonight and, and how we'll be handling questions. So there are some opportunities for live in the moment, uh, but then we'll definitely be open for Q&A towards the end. So, I'm excited we're here. This is part hey, of... Carl, one sec. So yeah. um, I did see somebody at, asked um, in the Q&A that someone mentioned that chat is disabled. So forgive me for saying chat, uh, use the Q&A function. That's what, that's what we'll be utilizing tonight. Thanks. Excellent. Sorry about that. Sometimes those words kind of all run together in these uh, in all these programs from one to the next. Uh, excited that um, we are here tonight. This is part of a refreshed um, communication plan. I'm trying to make sure our students are really clear on what our processes are, where the university is headed um, for the future years. Certainly, year as we approach the next academic year for you all, um, and really the spectrum of services that are being made available to you as you transition through your time here. I have the pleasure of talking to you first to really just kind of set the stage and um, highlight what the housing program is and where it will be for your time here at UC. Um, as, as many of you know, I suspect a good portion of the students on this call are current first year students living in our housing program. Um, and we have been, UC is an exciting place and it's probably part of what drew you here uh, that excitement has carried over to the housing program and the desire for students to get the full UC experience, be on campus, be in the mix, here for football games, the rec center, dining center, um, hanging out on the quad, all the things that our beautiful campus offers to you. And where we start and we set the picture for you is really the plan that's in place and what continues to materialize 
as we move forward year to year. You can see here on the right on the grid, and I'm not going to read this word to word, uh, word for word to all of you, but you can see on the right, we just want to highlight a little bit about the growth of the housing program. Um, I know there is some some thoughts and commentary around, you know, it's not big enough, we don't have enough space for everybody. But really what we're doing is we've been growing the program substantially year after year. And this has been a, a, a longstanding tradition of the university, really dating back a decade um, to when I actually first started at UC back in 2008. And you can see here on our grid, we're currently modeling and projecting a little over 8,000 students, just, just more than 8,000 students in our program that's with growing potential growing enrollment for the first year students. It's with a new building coming online. That's with looking at how we can continue to maintain or expand capacity for upperclassmen uh, as, as we move forward through time. So we're really intentional about that. Um, we are doing that in a methodical way, really with the four bullet points that we highlight over here. Um, one of them is you all, and again, if you're a first year student, you're probably benefiting from it. Uh, the way it was uh, adjusted and reprioritized in the last year, but really looking at the most proximate housing and having that in a very um, deliberate and intentional way prioritized and set aside for our first year students. So that's really how our program begins. That's the base of our program. And it's really, it's been that way naturally um, over time. Uh, we've always been a university where first year students come to the housing program, they establish themselves, they get their feet under them, and then they start to make decisions and move on from there. So that's always been uh, uh, north of 60, north of 70% of our housing program dedicated to our first year students. What's changed over time and really what's changed in the last few years is a desire of upperclassmen to stay on campus longer. Um, and that's been something we've been trying to navigate and really what pushes us towards the next level for the university, the next phase of master planning and designing our program. And you can see that's where we start to talk about new developments. The university is active trying to build more beds. You can see here, there's some initial plans for 2000 beds coming near term. Um, that's not for next fall, that's a few years out as it takes time to design and construct those, but that's just our first pass. There'll be buildings beyond that where we continue to add that'll provide more opportunities for first year students, more opportunities for upperclassmen, and more opportunities for graduate students, because we're just seeing renewed interest from everybody to be in Clifton and be part of the, the Bearcat community. The other piece that's uh, going on here as we look at the portfolio is how we um, look at the future of the campus. And I think that's something you're probably hearing and seeing a number of of different academic units in different parts of the campus, really, really study, ask questions, survey questions come out about is how do we maximize um, our space? How do we make sure it's the most efficient for you all to have your experience and, and move around campus, but not lose the flavor and not lose the excitement of what has been built from before us? Uh, so there's some opportunities there with housing. Most notably, we do that when we look at space within buildings. Where are there rooms? that are designed to house a few more people that we haven't had to do that in the past. There's some rooms that were designed as triples. We've operationally decided to do it as, trip, as doubles. Um, they might be returning back to triples. Sometimes we have rooms where we can add that uh, or we can convert, you know, most notably, you probably see it as other, other universities end up in the paper as well, talk about lounges or other spaces that are built as flex spaces and can be converted. So we go through that exercise every year, particularly when we tie to a chart like this, where we look at the growth. Um, and then the last thing that I think really ties to you all is you start to talk about what are my options within the university portfolio and around is really the university's engagement of private development. Um, we know we have north of 2000 beds being added to the community next year, and there's still a pipeline behind that annually of beds coming. So we're active talking to those private partners. We wanna make sure that they understand what you all need we want to make sure that they're not only building the highest price point, um, but they're making sure there's affordable housing, safe housing, the things that we know that support students and provide uh, real benefit to you. So that's where we start tonight. Uh, this is a growing program. We're trying to get as many people in. Trust me, we're all housing professionals on the side of the webinar. Our goal every day is to put somebody into our program. That's what we want to do. Um, we think we've designed a program for you this year that will get um, we'll again meet all of that need as we work through the process. Will it meet everybody's desires on day one? Probably not. 
Um, there are more students, more upperclassmen than we have beds allocated. Dan and Rich are going to talk through that a little bit um, today. But um, we've got an active plan, just like we had last year and in prior years, when students end up in a, in a holding pattern, how do we communicate with them? How do we educate them, provide them options, and, and you know ultimately move them in our program when space becomes available? Carl, we have a question in the chat. Um, so uh, is making a housing more accessible to upperclassmen a priority? It is, um, right? So when you fit into the, the kind of the spectrum there, we've always been a first year housing program first. Um, and then it's making as much space available for upperclassmen as possible. Um, you know, we've been fortunate uh, a number of years past where we've just had excess capacity and it's been able to be wide open. We're just not in a, a, condi a condition to do that right now. So we've got to create some additional rules to help you all know where do I line up? Uh, do I have a chance? Do I not? What I can commit and guarantee to today, and if I apologize if this wasn't clear, is everybody that expressed interest to us, we will work hard to try and find an option for you. Um, again, it may not be in round one of the process, it might be round two or round three, but we will keep working. As long as you're telling us that you're looking for it, we're gonna keep working to get it to you. I can't guarantee it. Um, you know, If we would, we would just have you all sign up and get everybody assigned on day one, but we will do our best. Um, and I think that's when I talk about the spectrum of services, uh, hopefully you all were aware of, and, and many of you also attended the student government housing fair that took place last week. That's part of those series of events of trying to help you all understand the options that are out there with the university in the local market. There's still There are still plenty of apartment spaces left, leases to be had, um, decisions to be made uh, within Clifton or in the surrounding areas. And we wanna make sure you're taking advantage of that uh, all the way through. All right, thanks, Carl. So um, I will discuss our next topic. So uh, I'm gonna overview just a couple of important pieces of information um, to be aware of uh, as we go into the renewal process beginning. So the first piece uh, that I do wanna highlight is that um, our current uh, projected, you know, capacity for renewal application process is going to stay consistent to what it was this year. So, you know, uh, th there has been some discussion of, you know, there's a housing, you know, not enough housing for folks who want it and everything. And so I do want to commit to everybody on the call that we are keeping housing um, flat and consistent with what uh, we are providing this year. So I think that's positive. Um, the renewal process I do want to highlight is limited to our current residents. So if you currently live in our communities and university housing, you are eligible for our renewal process. Um, and uh, the um, assignments process, as we do go into it, and Dan's going to talk a little bit more about our specific timeline for um, how the process is going to flow through renewal. Um, but uh, if, you know, as we go through that assignments process, we will be giving some additional priority to our uh, students who are expressing interest in returning to live with us based on their cohort and based on their honors status. And um, those locations that are available in the renewal process are primarily going to be in um, some of our least locations. So, you know, uh, as you think of those communities, it's going to be places like our uh, University Park apartments, you know. 101 Cory, um, a, a lot of those more apartment style communities. And then um, there will be some opportunities within the campus core uh, communities uh, for some special uh, populations to be assigned to. So if you have, you know, a housing accommodation or something similar to that, that really requires you to uh, be in a specific location, um, we, are, we are happy to continue to provide everything that you need for for those purposes. So, um, all right. And then um, a quick note off here to the right, we've got a couple of QR codes for you. I do want to highlight um, the top one is a link to our housing renewal page that does overview all of the processes that we're discussing tonight. It's got the timelines. It's got how we make decisions. We are really looking to be as transparent as possible and 
as clear as possible and what our process is looking like. So um, I do want to give a caveat with the QR code. Um, we are uh, excited to be in a couple of days uh, rolling out a new organization of our university website. I think it's going to be a lot more clear and clean and easy to find pieces of information. Um, this uh, QR code is not going to work in a couple days, um, but uh, we will continue to highlight where this information can be found um, on the housing website so that you can easily access it. So wherever we post this uh, video, we'll be sure to make sure that it's clearly linking to the housing renewal page on our website. <clears throat> All right, so um, the other pieces that uh, I do want to highlight here on this slide is, um, you know, while we are setting aside 1,500 beds for our renewal process, we are still um, encouraging everyone uh, to really consider all options in the uptown neighborhood. So, you know, Carl mentioned the off-campus housing fair that undergraduate student government hosted la uh, last week. Um, continue to explore uh, all of the different leasing companies, agencies, uh, nearby apartment complexes. Um, as much as we want to get everybody into our facilities as possible, um, it is good uh, to uh, be sure to have some backup plans just in case we aren't able to get absolutely everyone who expresses interest with us. Um, and then uh, if you are interested in uh, pursuing some of these other options in the Uptown area, we do have a housing resource search page. Um, and that's that bottom QR code on this uh, on the screen right now. Um, this will this can re really be used to help you find uh, other nearby options and um, see what's available out there. So um, kind of the same thing with the above QR code. Um, this this QR is not going to work in a couple of days, so I'll make sure that the, the new location for this information is clearly highlighted um, when we post this recording. All right, um, do we have any questions we uh, wanna to touch base on right now? I see a couple in there, Richard, but I, I have, I'm suspicious that th three of them I'm going to answer in my next section. Um, and if I don't hit them, I promise I'll come back to them, but I'm pretty sure that the uh, the piece I'm about to go over will help answer some of these questions that are coming in right now, so. Okay, perfect. I will uh, go on to the next slide for us then. Awesome. So hi again, everybody. Again, my name is Dan McGill. I'm the Associate Director of Housing. Um, my job is primarily housing operations. So um, everything that you do with the housing office that has to do with the contract, the application, your bill, um, all the sort of nuts and bolts that that uh, come along with interacting with the housing office um, falls under sort of my purview. So I'm going to walk through you, uh, with you all a bit of the timeline of what this is going to look like. And I'm going to hopefully answer some of your practical questions that I see coming in about specific buildings and how do I renew and how do I fill out this form and that kind of thing. Um, just to give kind of a, a brief overview and, and touch on some of the things that Richard said, the goal here is for us to be as transparent as possible and to make this as stress-free as possible. Um, this is, as Carl mentioned, you know, we we want to grow our program. We want to provide beds for as many students as possible. Um, we want housing to be vibrant and thriving and that kind of thing. Um, but we do have an operating condition right now where we have a, a specific number of beds that we have available to us. And so um, we know that that means that may, we may not be able to provide renewals for every single student that's currently living on campus. So um, what we want this to be is is, is very transparent, very much um, upfront, provide you with as much information as possible, give you as much information as early as possible so that you know what your status is and what where, where you're at with it. Um, and you can make informed decisions um, about this kind of stuff. Our goal is also to make sure that as little of this process is time sensitive as possible, um, because we really don't want you to feel like you have to be skipping class or waking up early or anything like that to get on and do these kinds of things. There are some time windows when we want you to do things by and some deadlines because that's the way processes work. Um, but there's not none of this process is going to be first come first served um, by design. So with that being said, um, you're looking at some pieces right here. 
um, that we will walk through. Um, the intent to renew form, which I saw a question come in about, is um, it's essentially still in the exact same place as the housing application. If you're familiar with where that's at on the housing portal, then you'll know right where to go. It is basically just a page at the beginning of the housing application that you will fill out before the housing application process. Um, this is our intent to make sure that the process is not first come first served this year. So on January 29th, this form will become available in the housing portal. Students that are currently living on campus with us right now can log in and can fill out this form. And that's the only thing that you'll need to do to get the process started. It takes place between January 29th and February 5th. Again, not super time sensitive, not come first serve. We do not want you to stress about it. We just want you to get on and do it at some point during that time period so that we understand how many students living on campus right now are seeking housing for the upcoming 24-25 school year. Hey, Dan, there's a yes. question in the chat uh, that I think is good for this part. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we had someone ask if we uh, are not accepted or selected, uh, do we get a deposit mm -hmm. back? Perfect question. Yep. So this intent to renew form does not come with any commitment whatsoever. You're not signing a contract. You're not giving us any money. You're not doing anything that you cannot walk away from or that you will be in any way negatively impacted by if you don't receive housing with us in the upcoming school year. This is truly just a form that you'll fill out. It's very simple. Uh, it's a couple clicks. Let us know that you're interested. Um, we've got all your information already, obviously, in our system. So really, you're just you're signing up and you're letting, letting us know um, and we're getting you into that process. So there's nothing there's no harm to it. We're not taking any commitment from you or anything like that. It is truly just an interest form. Um, once we receive that information, starting on February 5th, we will essentially do a randomized process to start letting students know if you are able to um, fill out the housing application. There are some weighted criteria to it. Um, that's an institutional decision. Again, transparent as possible. We want you all to know what's, what's going on. Um, the weighted criteria are basically it's reverse order of class standing. It's, it's the institution, housing, higher education in general um, shows that it's just it's better for students that are earlier on in their academic careers to live on campus and be as close to um, campus as possible. And so the weighted criteria would be reverse order of class standing. And then also there is some weighted criteria provided to the honors program as well, which is a small special group of students. Um, it's not going to take up a large portion of those 1500 beds, but that is another criteria that would be applied to um, that process. And so we will randomize those folks. Um, and then you see there that we will start sending out notices to students to let you know if you're going to be able to fill out the housing application or not. We will get that information to you as early and as quickly in February as possible. You can see the timeline there so that we can start letting you know um, that by February 9th, we'll have everybody notified and students can log back in and start signing the housing application. So um, just to recap there, fill out the renewal form. February 5th is when that closes. We'll start sending out communication. You'll know from us no later than February 9th if you're going to be able to apply for housing for the upcoming school year. Um, so that will give you information early. You'll know what your, your status is. And then at that point, you will get instructions from us via email to log back into your housing application. And that's when you actually fill out the application. That's the contract. That's the housing um, application fee. It's the stuff that you're familiar with in terms of going through the process, roommate matching, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's when you actually commit to filling out a housing application for the upcoming school year. So um, we know that that means some, some different things that might happen to you sort of logistically, right? It may mean that somebody that you were interested in being a roommate with may not be somebody that is also going to get housing for the upcoming fall. Um, you know, we, it depends a lot on how many students that fill out the interest form and where we're at with that, but we understand that there's some logistical things that may occur there. So um, during that time period, we're going to do our best to try to assist students with, again, early information. You see their resident education and development is going to host some programming to try to help students do some roommate matching. Um, there's also roommate matching within the housing application as well. We're going to give students as much information as possible so you can make those decisions. Um, students that are not selected for housing will automatically be added to the wait list. You do not have to commit to that. You don't have to do anything to be on the wait list. We just we submitted that you were interested. We sent you a notice that you weren't going to be able to provide it to you, but we will put you on the wait list. And we know that we get cancellations throughout the course of the process. As soon as students cancel, make other decisions, decide that housing is not for them. Um, when we receive those, we will take the next student off of that wait list and notify you and let you know. And so that's something that Carl was mentioning earlier, is that even if we can't get you in in the very beginning of this process, um, it is our intention to still continue to try to work really all throughout the summer up until we move in um, to reach out to any student who expressed interest. Um, we understand that you may not still be interested, but we will do our best to try to reach out to folks and let you know. So um, after that takes place, we will then move into a room selection process. 
Um, that is uh, essentially students log back in and you can self-select the room that you would like to live in. Um, you can do that with roommates. You can do that by yourself. You will get an email with a specific time slot that tells you, hey, on February 20th at noon, you can log back in and you can select a room. Um, this process is, if there's any piece to this that's a little bit first come first serve, there is a little bit aspect to that where certain some students will be on February 20th, some will be on the 21st, the 22nd. Um, there is a, a sort of a time sensitive aspect to logging in at the time that you were uh, assigned to select a room. Uh, we will send out lots of information on what that looks like and how to do that process. There's a really great tutorial on our website that shows a video on how to do it, um, but essentially at that point, you're just logging back in and picking the bed. Um, there was a question in there about specifically renewing in a particular building. That is the point when you would be locking yourself into a particular building. If you like it in UPA, you want to live there again, um, you log back in, select a space in UPA. You can be there. It's, you know, there is obviously limited capacity in each building, but um, that would be your process in terms of going through and trying to, to assign yourself to a specific building that you're interested in. So, um, after that, again, February 23rd will be mostly full um, in terms of upperclassmen. And then at that point, we would turn ourselves to that wait list. And as we get cancellations in, we will continue to try to assign students to housing and offer an opportunity to apply for anybody that missed the opportunity originally. So, so Dan, just to clarify, um, we had a question here. Um, so does filling out the application guarantee a spot? Yes, absolutely. So we do not take a housing application from a student unless we are ready to guarantee you housing. So the intent form is truly just an intent form. But when you get to that point in the housing application where you're signing that the terms and conditions, the huge long document that um, you're probably not going to read all of, uh, and you pay that deposit, that is the university entering a contract with you. So you will have housing with us for the fall when we get to that point. As soon as you receive an email from us, really, that says we have housing for you, you've got a spot as long as you log in and do what you're supposed to do and fill out the application. So um, as far as the question about folks that live farther away, I, I hear that and understand that. That is some of the ways that we uh, manage the incoming first year class. That is that is not currently um, the way that the upperclassmen and returning residents are are being managed. Um, I, I take that feedback, but at this point it's not. It's, it's by cohort and it is um, sort of agnostic of home state and home location. Hey, Dan, there's a couple questions. There's two in there about cohort status and opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have this on, it might've been in the, the winter break mailing. It might be up on the web, but can you walk, walk through a, again, the, the organization of the cohorts and how we intend to process and maybe even give some, you know, not exact, but some, some numbers, you know, we round numbers, we talk of, you know, a hundred and mm -hmm. break the groups and, yep, and yep. From there. I mean, so really, it's just it's going to be in reverse order of cohort standing in terms of priority. So students in the um, TG 23-24 cohort, that is our current first year students, would get first priority. And so we will go through students that are in that cohort first in terms of our, our randomization process um, and send them out notice. That, and then after that, we would move on to the next cohort, which would be TG 22-23, uh, I believe. And so it would, it would move down the list that way. Um, as Carl mentioned, it tends to, most of our housing portfolio tends to be first year students. So the vast majority of students that live on campus right now are in that code, cohort of TG 23-24. Um, so I would expect that when we're talking about 1500 beds, the majority of those beds are probably going to go to current freshman rising sophomore students. Um, this is, again, full transparency. This is the first time we've done the process this way. So we have um, historical data about what our housing portfolio looks like and who lives here and that kind of thing. Um, but we have never done this specific process before this way. So I can't tell you exactly what the breakout would look like, but I would imagine that mostly we're looking at rising sophomores uh, receiving priority for the 1500 students uh, uh, available in those beds. So. No, it's, when we refer to cohort, we're talking really about, um, you know, the 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 tuition guarantee cohort and the, the process that um, the institution has when it comes to bringing in cohorts of students. Um, and so it's really just about your class status and your class year. Um, but we, we've referred to it as cohort because it's not about how many credit hours you've received um, and whether you're truly a sophomore or a junior based on class standing and that kind of thing. It's your incoming first year cohort that you stay with essentially the whole way through your um, academic career here at UC. So if you are currently a first year student uptown, this is your first year attending UC, you are most likely in the 23-24 cohort, and that is a rising sophomore essentially. So 
Um, I think you can move to the next screen, Richard. I'll definitely keep an eye on the questions. I think the next screen's similar information. Um, yeah, I think this is really just kind of restated in a lot of ways. Um, and so there's some some uh, next steps that you need to take. Uh, the the biggest thing to emphasize, and I know I said this a couple times, but I will say it again, is is really just that that first piece there, January 29th to February 5th. If you're interested in living on campus with us, please just log into the housing application during that time. Um, you won't be able to access the actual application. It's just an intent to renew form. You'll fill it out. It takes two minutes. It is not time sensitive other than doing it sometime during that time window. Um, and our intention is to be just very transparent, very stress-free, early information to you as much as we can. Um, again, we know that we may, if we have more than 1,500 students that fill that form out, we know we'll be sending out some um, not the great, not you know, not positive information to some students. But um, you know, this is a much better system than just saying first come first serve because we know that that will create anxiety and stress. So, Dan, I think I still see one or two questions coming through about the cohorts yep uh, maybe try again trying to give a a very specific example yeah and let's say we have and, I, and i'll set you up here let's say we have 100 beds available and all the intent to renew forms come in and we've said we've identified to the to the students here in this call right the, the tg 23 24 cohort is the first grouping the first priority out of that grouping then would be our honor students Let's say there's 20 honor students. We know we have 100 beds. We would make those offers to the honor students to go in, complete an application, and confirm that yes, now that they've been offered, they actually want to live in campus housing. 100 minus 20 leaves 80 beds left. We go to our next grouping. That would be our cohort 23, 24. Let's say there's 50 students in that population. Still more beds than we have uh, students in the pool, we would offer everybody in that pool a chance to sign up. Okay. 20 plus 50, 70. I've still got 30 beds left. And, and jump in here if I'm misspeaking, but we still have 30 beds left. So we're going to go to the next cohort, which is TG 2223. Honors first priority. I've got 30 students in that honors group, and I have 30 beds left. We'd make full offers to that group. And at that point, the housing office would pause making offers because as, as Dan highlighted there, there is that time uh, for students to complete their application, right? We're not gonna offer to people that we will not be able to give them a bed to in this first round. So when we get to the 16th, I think really to drill down, when am I gonna find out? Some people will find out as early as February 6th when we start sorting all the data. The next group of individuals will find out when we see who didn't complete a housing application. So let's say we get to the 16th, we've made those 100 offers and only 80 students did not, uh, or only 80 students completed the housing application. That now means we have 20 beds available. We're gonna offer out right away to those students, uh, to new students, those 20 beds. And we just pick up where we left off in that priority list and keep offering. And that's gonna be the process every week. As you can imagine, and some of you maybe even know some students that have done this, you know, they sign up, um, things, life changes, plans change, they cancel later. Every week, that's what we're working through is cancellations, changes of situations for students and trying to offer them as quickly as possible. Um, and, and so to Dan's point earlier, we intend for this to be a weekly process for our team. Um, we'd love for it to be instantaneous for all of you, but it's gonna be weekly as we continue to move through the lists uh, as space becomes available. I also noted about the prioritization in the first pass. I think the other thing I didn't drill down into um, is once we understand all the beds that are needed for first year students and the university is working on those processes, how do we move those timelines up? How do we get real clarity uh, earlier in the summer about who's truly coming and who isn't? But once we know that detail, we're gonna reallocate beds to upperclassmen. So that's why I say, and that's why Dan shared about automatically going to the wait list. We're not gonna kick anybody out um, of expressing interest unless you self opt out of it, right? We wanna keep trying to meet that. So staying in there, um, I don't know what that volume is gonna be. We're working towards that, but we do anticipate we'll be able to redirect some beds as we get into that assignment process in the summer and be able to pull some other individuals up. Again, I want you to hear, we encourage you to be active. 
Um, someone earlier had asked about, will there be beds left? Was there opportunities to lease? There are still apartments. There's still leases to be had in the community. You want to be active. You need to make a decision that's good for you, that puts you in a position to be calm and to work through the summer and not be concerned uh, or confused about where you're living. Um, that is a situation now. Is that going to be the situation in July that there's still plenty of leases to be had? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so that's why we want you to be active, do your research, use our website to find some information. Student government has some resources as well. Um, and, and again, reach out to other students. I think there's a good network here of upperclassmen. Hopefully you all have a chance to meet some in your classes, in groups, clubs, organizations that can also some provide some guidance about some of the local apartment communities and options that are available. A couple questions in here I can help crank through real quick. I'm just kind of working from the bottom. Um, the honors, the university honors program is a very specific program. If you're in it, you would be familiar with it. It is something that you have to apply for. You have to take specific classes to be part of. Um, it is it's not based on your GPA or anything like that, that you sort of automatically end up in. It is a, a specific program that you typically apply for as part of your admission to the institution. Um, and so that's a, it's a very specific and, and sort of small program um, that we're referring to there. Um, yeah, uh, see apartment style housing. So all of our Every single um, facility and bed space that is under sort of the purview of UC housing and you have a UC housing contract, that's part of the UC housing portfolio. That all that goes on your student bill. Uh, you can pay for it through you know, Catalyst and, and there's financial aid options and all those kinds of things. We refer to them on our website and in communication and things like that as traditional style, suite style, apartment style to give you an idea of what is in the unit. And sometimes that's a price point thing as well. And, um, you know, apartment style typically just means there's a kitchen in the unit, right? Um, but that's all still UC housing. The difference between a Morgan's, which is apartment style and a Calhoun, um, and even a location where we have leased beds, such as the Deacon, which we refer to as apartment style. If you've got a contact, a contract through us that you filled out um, the housing application, signed to the terms and conditions, that's UC housing. Um, and it still goes on your student bill and you can, uh, financial implications are all the same, regardless of which building that you're living in. Um, I actually don't know the answer to this next question about where on Catalyst your cohort information is available. I'm assuming it's it's one of the things that's in um, in your sort of demographic information within Catalyst. Um, I don't know if either of you guys are familiar with exactly where that field's located. I'm logging in now. Uh, Kaylee, I'll get that answer in the chat to you once I uh, uh, identify the screen. Perfect. Um, and then I see a question about roommate matching. It, it is actually typically not. So typically our incoming first year students are considered kind of their own bucket of housing applicants. And we tend to uh, place them together in facilities together and um, they are roommates together and that kind of thing. Typically we have those students separated from our upperclassmen students. Um, if there's a real specific situation that you wanna reach out to our office about, we have you know siblings and things like that. Feel free to reach out to our office. We're happy to work with you. Not everything is 100% set in stone, but typically the roommate matching process is returning residents with returning residents, first year students with first year students. So. I think that's all I had for sort of um, pre-planned comments on my end. I'll keep an eye on the chat here. Um, otherwise, I believe that's it for my section. Thank you all for your time. OK, well, that is all of our slides that we had prepared. Um, now we are good to open it up. Like if folks have questions, you are welcome to um, type them into our Q&A section and we will get to them as they come in. So the Deacon question there is uh, we have the Deacon is a private facility that we lease bed spaces at. Um, so the students that live there through UC are on our contract and they're part of the UC housing uh, terms and conditions. But the building itself is not owned by the university. We we've leased the beds and then we lease them to students through our process, which is something that we have in a number of different facilities around campus. Uh, if you're familiar with U Square or CP Cincy, uh, places like that are in the same type of uh, situation as the Deacon as well. Um, so do we have information about prices? So um, if you go onto our website, uh, currently we do have under the apply tab, um, it's a little drop down at the top of the 
the website. Um, if you hover over apply and scroll down, um, you will see a rates tab. And so um, once you go onto the rates page, it is broken out into your given cohort. So you'll need to know which cohort you are. But if you're currently at first year at UC, your cohort is 23, 24. Um, so then you would go to the 23, 24 page, and then you can see all of your um, available rates for the different styles of rooms, whether that's traditional suite apartment, or if you're living in a single versus with roommates. Uh, running through a couple things here yet. Yeah, so yes, we uh, expect to and will almost certainly have um, the Deacon as an option for renewal students. Um, you will be able to select that as one of the locations uh, as part of the housing selection process. Uh, more generally, I see a question here about sort of reapplying to the same apartment style building you in, you're in. Um, let me just kind of review a little bit. So the application process itself and the contract for housing is slightly separate from room selection. So when you fill out the contract, you'll sign up for housing, you'll apply, uh, you'll uh, sign the terms and conditions, you'll pay your application fee. That's all the contract that basically says you've got a bed in the portfolio. Um, then shortly after that, you'll have an opportunity to log in and select from a specific bed space within um, all of the different options that we have. And so that's the point when you would have an opportunity to select from spaces at the Deacon, uh, a space at UPA, you know, if, you've, if you're in a building right now that you really uh, want to stay in, that kind of thing. Um, I will say that there is some um, intent to have uh, buildings that are more approximate to the center of campus, campus core, those types of locations be for first year students. Um, so if you're currently in a, a Daniels or a Dabney, for example, a more traditional style, sometimes people refer it to as like a dorm style residence hall, um, those tend to be more geared toward first year students and a first year experience. Um, so if that's your intention, that may not be an option for you when you go to renew your housing and, and select a specific bed space. Uh, but if you have a number of different options that you're interested in, that would be the point when you go through, um, you've already signed your contract, you paid your application fee, you'll get something from us that says, hey, on February 20th at 11 a.m., you can log back in and pick your bed space. And then at that point, you would log in, you'll see all the different spaces that are available to you. If you've got a roommate that wanted to do this process with you, you can either create a roommate group or you can do it at the same time. You can pick from what we have available and select those bed spaces. And so when you fill out the application, you're not leasing a specific bed space and a specific building, you're just signing a contract with UC Housing, and then later on you're picking a bed space, essentially. Um, hey, Dan, there's a question in here um, about only first years in particular loans. Can you talk about our typical philosophy with allocation of space? Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about priority, but you know, there's a lot of gray areas uh, yep. with what we do and just so students can understand how we're trying to parse things out. Yep, yep. So we do a couple of different things. Um, one of the nice things about this, as much as we have talked about priorities for first year students and that kind of thing, when it comes to selecting bed spaces for the places that are open and available, upperclassmen do get priority on that. Um, first year assignments will not take place until much later into the summer. Um, and so when upperclassmen students, returning residents go through and select bed spaces, everything will be open and available to you that is sort of designated for a returning resident. Now there is a philosophy that we have some spaces that are uh, more designed for first year students. So like I mentioned earlier, our traditional style residence halls, um, the university is taken to call them campus quarter locations that are more proximate to the center of campus are generally considered and designated for first year students. Um, upperclassmen students, returning residents, we generally try to assign to spaces that are considered a little bit more of an independent style living, more of your suite style living, more of your apartment style living, um, more of the um, least locations that we've talked about in, in and around campus. Um, just uh, that's just typical philosophy in terms of which students need to get the most services and support versus which students um, uh, sort of know how to navigate campus a little bit more and have the ability to maybe have their own kitchen and cook their own food and that kind of thing as they move into their second, third, fourth years on campus, that kind of thing. So um, when you log in to select the bed space as part of the room selection process, you will see everything that you're eligible to assign to and everything that is currently available. And then for those returning residents, as I mentioned, those tend to be more of the suite style and apartment style um, sort of the a little bit more mature living environment. 
We had one question in um, the Q&A that I'd like to answer. Uh, it was, would students with a disability be, be prioritized for housing to meet their accommodations? So that's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so any students who have a uh, registered accommodation with accessibility resources that is uh, labeled as priority housing, um, we will be in touch with you directly to um, discuss how we can provide a space that uh, accommodates what uh, you've registered with the university. Um, if you have an accommodation on file with accessibility resources that is not designated as priority housing, you will go through the same intent to renew process that we outlined um, in this presentation. If you're not sure if your accommodation is considered priority housing, um, accessibility resources had said to us that you are more than welcome to give them a call, shoot them an email. They are happy to clarify whether or not your accommodation is designated as uh, priority housing. So thank you for that question. That was a good one. Another question here, um, if you're on the wait list, at what point would you say to essentially like book something else, basically, um, especially since we may be offering wait list uh, students into the summer? Um, my, my consistent advice uh, to all students, even at this point, before, you know, we even get into the intent to renew, before we even have a wait list started, um, my advice is to always be considering all of your options. So um, right now, I would say, you know, if you're interested in university housing, that's, we're excited and we hope we are able to offer you a space, but you, we shouldn't be the only people that you're looking at. So I would recommend for you to go ahead and begin looking at other properties, begin looking at other leasing companies um, to see uh, if there are other um, places that you might like to live next year. Um, at what point would I say to abandon the idea? I, that's, it, it's so difficult to put a hard deadline on that. Um, as Carl mentioned earlier, people will cancel all the way through up until it's time to move in. Um, even after move-in happens, people will just have not shown up and then more beds become available. So, um, it's, it's extremely difficult for us to just put a final deadline on it. So um, for that reason, I would just say it, the deadline is what you're comfortable with, essentially. And I, I know that's not an extremely helpful answer, um, but continue to just explore all your options at this moment is my best advice. And I'll I'll just follow up, Richard, and, and say that my intention in terms of sort of operationalizing this and processing is to get as much definitive information out to students throughout the month of February. Um, again, that does not mean that we're going to stop working that wait list as we get cancellations in, but we want the majority of our work to take place in that month of February so that you have as much information as possible at that point. Um, as we move into March, it will truly be a day-to-day. -day. We filled all of our beds. Someone canceled. We'll offer the next person off the wait list if that helps. A little bit. Um, so there's another question here. Uh, is there a list of properties that we'd be able to choose from for renewal? So on that uh, property or on that contract renewal uh, uh, QR code or the linked page on our website that uh, I shared earlier, um, if you scroll down about halfway, um, we have a section of that page called uh, community communities available via contract renewal. So currently the ones that we are anticipating being available for this process, um, and this is always subject to change, properties might get redesignated to, uh, we might add some, we might take some away for to redesignate as first years, um, but currently our anticipated uh, properties available for renewal are 101 East Cory, Bellevue Gardens, CP Cincy, The Eden, Jefferson House, and University Edge. So again, there might be some other ones. Um, this list could change, but um, that's that's the current um, list right now. Can I display the QR code? Yes, I can. Let me share my screen. One sec. Ooh. 
While Richard's um, pulling that information up, I will share some additional enhancements we have going on with the housing office in terms of connection and communicating with us. Um, we have uh, uh, added additional full-time staff, so we've been transitioning away from a student-led call center to a full-time staff uh, call center. Uh, we have four full-time operators, uh, coordinators that are that are online and available. Uh, we'll have be posting online uh, extended hours during the application periods so that you have an opportunity to call in and connect with us live if you need to. Um, you can do that in a couple ways. One is a direct connection. You get in the queue and you work your way through to us. But our phone system is also advanced enough that you can leave a phone number and request a callback. You don't lose your place in line. Everybody gets lumped into a queue. And as an agent becomes available, our system will just dial out directly to you. Uh, we have a pretty good track record of being able to complete that uh, within one day's time, usually same day. Uh, we do keep staff around later in the afternoon, particularly if the queue builds up um, so that they can make those callbacks before we go home. We also have plenty, you know, if the phones do get busy, we have additional staff throughout the housing program and in uh, campus services that are able to log in and take part in that response and make sure that we've got appropriate resources available. But that's one thing that we're doing. Um, I'm also happy to share that the, we believe launching next week, you will see two chat opportunities with us. Um, so the website will be able to handle some very basic questions. If you're not finding information quickly in your search, you can ask your question through a chat bot um, it's already in place on the admissions website. We're excited to be the next office into this new UC solution. Um, but it, it'll be able to answer very basic questions. And actually, from a spectrum of offices, it won't. If you're on the housing website, it doesn't just answer housing questions. It'll also be able to answer questions about admissions, uh, about financial aid. There's a few other offices in there um, that it can redirect you to resources and, and help um, highlight information. It also, uh, we're going to be activating one of the advanced features of it, which is a live chat. So there'll be designated hours. We'll have that posted on the website during application periods, during peak activity times. We'll have staff that's also dedicated to engage in a live chat. So if you just need to ask a quick question, it's not really worthy of, of trying to get on a phone or asking for a phone call back, um, but, it, but it needs to be sooner than an email sent in and waiting for an email response back, we're going to have that available. And we think that's going to, you know, substantially cut down on wait time trying to uh, communicate with our team. I see a number of questions in here about specific buildings and that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll give some general information real quick. So uh, as Richard mentioned, the website link that he provided is the best location to see current list of what we expect to be available for upperclassmen students. Um, I, I as I was talking, I realized I, I think I was mentioning a couple of different buildings. I wasn't even completely thinking about the different buildings. I was thinking about them more sort of as examples. Um, so that list is the one that's currently the most um, up to date. Uh, it is important to remember that one, those can change. A lot of this, again, is us trying to balance with enrollment transparency completely here, trying to balance with enrollment management, the number of incoming first year students we're expecting, what we think we're going to need for uh, returning residents compared to upperclassmen students. Sometimes that balance can change a little bit, right? Um, and so if we think that we are going to have the opportunity to provide additional returning students um, in a building such as the Deacon or U Square, we will adjust that list, absolutely, and we will provide those opportunities for students as part of the room selection process. So what we have listed there is current, um, and that is what would, would typically be available if we were launching the process today. If that list changes, we will update it. Um, some of these facilities are also blended when it comes to the number of the students that are living in those locations. There are different populations of students that need to live in specific locations, for example. Um, you know, there are um, you know, particular uh, athletics teams and things like that that have freshmen on them and that live in lo particular locations. There are living and learning communities that are designated in particular buildings that might be predominantly freshmen or upperclassmen. And those kinds of things sometimes don't follow the specific rules that we think we have in place for a building. Um, and so you may see that not every single one of these buildings is 100% this way or that way in terms of the way we assign students. It's a bit of a, uh, a blended community in some instances. So the website's always going to be the best place for the most up-to-date information. Uh, if those, our goal was to provide as many options and as much flexibility for returning residents as possible. And so if we can provide additional buildings, additional facilities that we can offer to you, um, that's where we will update those and provide those as well. Let's see, Richard is going through some answers there. So I will just quickly say it is 659. 
Um, so we'll stick around for about 30 more seconds. If anybody has a last minute question you didn't get in, and then I think it's about time for us to wrap up. Um, I will, as I kill time in case a question comes in, um, just mention that if you have a specific question that you don't feel like we got answered all the way, or if there's something particular to you that you didn't get a chance to answer because it's unique to you, please reach out to our office. Carl just mentioned all the different um, uh, communication enhancements and things that we're doing to try to provide service to students. So feel free to reach out to us during business hours. Happy to get you via email um, or phone call or chat. Um, we can get your specific question answered um, and make sure that we're getting those things to you. So. All right. So we are at seven o'clock. Um, again, thank you all for attending. Um, this is the first time we've done one of these. And so um, it seems like a lot of people were engaging and asking a lot of good questions. So um, if you know this is something that you did find helpful, uh, we definitely appreciate hearing feedback. Um, uh, either way. So um, if there are things that we weren't able to cover that you think would be helpful in the future, um, please feel free to reach out to any of the three of us and let us know. Um, we are always happy to hear um, how we can improve our services. So um, with all that said, uh, Carl, Dan, anything else to add? Not at all. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. And as Richard said, um, let us know. We look to continue to do some more of these throughout the year, and uh, we appreciate everybody's attendance and, and questions. Great night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.